Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Leading the Future webinar on cultivating resilience and leaders. My name is Molly Buss, and I am the Community Relations Manager at the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. And my role for today's webinar is to moderate the chat. Um, just a few logistical items I wanted to review to help you navigate the webinar functions today. Um, you're welcome to share your thoughts and comments um, throughout the webinar via the chat box. Um, and if you're comfortable and want to share your responses with everyone participating in the webinar, just make sure you update the to field in the chat box to all panelists and attendees. And then just know that you do have the opportunity to minimize the chat box. Um, and we invite for you to do that during the components that aren't interactive to help you stay present. And then just note throughout the webinar as questions come up, um, you can submit those using the Q&A um, function. And we'll get to as many questions as we have time for at the end of the session. Um, if you aren't able to find those icons, try hovering your mouse over the bottom of the screen and they should pop up for you. Uh, we'll send out an email with a recording of the webinar and other res resources later today. Um, so without further ado, I'll now turn things over to back and center director, Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so pleased that you've joined us for Cultivating Resilience in Leaders, the Key to Transformational Leadership, which is part of our Leading the Future series with Carlson Executive Education. This year marks the third time we have co-hosted this event. While we had initially planned to hold this event in person, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have prevented us from doing so. But as resilient leaders, we're adaptable. And by moving this event online, we actually have attendees today from around the United States and beyond. This year marks the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing's 25th anniversary. Throughout our history, we have provided learning opportunities to communities, organizations, and leaders like you. We are committed to building and supporting systems of leadership that are equitable, inclusive, and diverse. We know that anyone can be a leader, regardless of formal title, and that now more than ever, different and whole person perspectives lead to personal and organizational transformation. The Bakken Center offers many opportunities for leaders, including our Wellbeing Leadership Retreat Series that can be customized and offered online for your organization, mindfulness at work programming, mindful leadership coaching, and specialized consulting. You may learn more about the center and the ways that we can support your organization by visiting our website at csh.umn.edu. I'd like to now invite Nora Anderson, the Executive Director of Carlson Executive Education, to offer some opening remarks and introductions. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. It is wonderful to be here. Welcome to everyone for joining us. I would like to um, reiterate Mary Jo's comments about this, uh, this series. And many of you uh, perhaps joined us uh, last year and the previous year. Um, we, when we decided to partner on this event series um, around leading the future, this really came from speaking to, to all of you as we spoke with leaders in business, healthcare, nonprofit, in our business, in, in our community here in the Twin Cities. No matter what level people are at in organizations and what industry you're working in, that topic of leadership just comes through loud and clear. And when we thought about what can we really bring to our uh, community here in the Twin Cities, this theme of leadership was, was just came, came front and center. Um, two years ago, we started with our Mindful Leadership Conference, last year leading with purpose, and now it couldn't be more timely, uh, the, the theme of cultivating resilience in leaders. So we're just delighted to um, continue to bring this series to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am the executive director at Carlson Executive Education. And again, this topic is um, ever present for us in all of our solutions. Um, we've been partnering with business here in the Twin Cities for over 50 years. Uh, we have customized solutions, leadership development programs, and uh, programs focused on cutting edge business trends, and also short, short courses, 
that we just launched a, a, a online program this week on inclusive leadership. Some of these same themes that Mary Jo was just speaking to, um, to really move our business community forward and bring timely content to all of you. So now we would really like to shift gears and get into the content of today. We have three wonderful speakers um, on our topic of resilience. Um, I will be turning it over to Mary Jo very, very shortly. I will introduce her. She will be speaking. Also, Marianne Johnson, who is a uh, mindfulness and well being instructor at the Center for Spirituality and Healing. And then we also have a special guest, um, Nancy Grichix Manley, from, who leads human resources at Room and Board, which is such a wonderful organization here in our business community. Um, and they will all be sharing their insights um, and examples of bringing resilience to individual leaders and also to organizations. Uh, so our first speaker will be Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer. Um, as Molly mentioned, she is the founder and director of the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. She is also a tenured professor in the nursing school. Uh, she has her doctoral degree in public health focused on health research policy and administration. She has been the principal or co-principal investigator on numerous NIH clinical trials focusing on mindfulness meditation. Um, she has authored more than 150 publications and she speaks, of course, extensively here in the Twin Cities, but all across the country and in different cities across the world. So Mary, Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Nora. We are in a time of unusual and really unparalleled turbulence. I suspect that everyone on the webinar today is experiencing it. Some days you feel as though you are in danger swirling around the rocks. Other days, it feels like you're being carried downstream out of control. And other days, it feels like you are in a fog. And that turbulence is matched by uncertainty. In both personal and in work lives, people are really yearning for stability, predictability, and well being. In the lecture today, we'll be addressing transformational leadership as, um, as a key, um, key need in today's um, chaotic and turbulent world. We'll be also talking about resilience and well being. And one of the things that we'll be highlighting is the importance of mindfulness as an important strategy for cultivating um, both resilience and well being. And then I'm so excited. We're going to be learning from a Minnesota company, um, Room and Board, about um, their model of um, leadership and the many ways that they um, have demonstrated organizational uh, resilience. And then there'll also be an opportunity for you to um, ask questions. So the ideas about leadership, you know, have changed so dramatically, you know, over the past decade. The old view of a good leader was that the leader was in charge, would tell people what to do, create the vision, and have all the answers. David Gergen, the founding director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard University, is quoted as saying, those days of command and control leadership um, have evaporated. So when you think about the skills needed for leaders today, it's really a very, very different skill set. We need leaders who can deeply listen, who can listen to learn and suspend judgment. We need leaders who are keenly aware of systems and think in a systems thinking way. So we need to be in organizations moving from a silo mentality to much more of a systems mentality. Um, we need leaders who are self-aware and that's one of the reasons why developing skills that cultivate self-awareness are, are so critical. We need leaders who are capable of seeking diverse perspectives. And that involves respectful inclusion within our organizations and a recognition that conflicting opinions do not present a problem. Rather, they present a potential resource that can sharpen our thinking and lead to innovative options for, for action. And we also need leaders who can suspend certainty 
and embrace uncertainty. And boy, is that critical um, today. Um, there's so little that is certain today. When we suspend certainty, it enables us to see beyond our habitual lenses to get a broader and potentially more accurate view of what's going on around us. It also creates that space for diverse views so that new knowledge, different knowledge, different ideas can come through. And finally, we need leaders who are capable of taking adaptive action. And when I talk about adaptive action, what I'm talking about is the ability to anticipate future needs, to build collective support and understanding within the organization, to have the skills to be able to adapt your responses based on continuous learning. And oh my gosh, when you think of what happened in March, um, you know, when the pandemic um, uh, began to rapidly unfold, the speed with which um, organizations needed to um, pivot, um, to turn on a dime in terms of, of the ways that they carried out their work really, really required skills of agility. And finally, um, adaptive leaders demonstrate accountability through transparency um, in decision-making. And that transparency so critical today as uh, the people within our organizations um, have such fear related to the uncertainty and the lack of predictability. So having leaders that can model transparent decision-making is really critical. Many would say that there's never been a greater need for, transformation, for transformational leadership, leadership that encourages, inspires, and motivates employees to innovate and create change that will help grow um, future success. So um, at various times um, throughout the webinar today, we're gonna stop and pause and just get um, uh, our finger on the pulse of what you're thinking. And so the first poll question that um, we're posing is, when you think about leaders today, which skill is most, um, most needed? We'll just take a few minutes Thank and Mary Jo, um, while people are submitting their questions or their um, response to the poll too, um, someone did ask if you could define systems a bit more in regards to awareness of systems. Sure. So we'll give it just um, a couple more seconds here. Responses are still trickling in. Great. You know, this really, um, it, it doesn't surprise me. And I actually think this is really encouraging that people say the skill that's most needed in leaders today is um, skills around um, deep listening. So I think that really reflects the, the need to um, sort of, you know, shift leadership style. So the question that somebody asked, um, um, and we can pull that one down, Molly, that poll, um, was what do I mean when I said awareness of systems? So um, as in so many of our organizations, um, we have functioned um, in, in silo mentality. We've kind of only known the severe sphere right around us. And uh, awareness of systems um, helps us recognize that we have to break down boundaries, break down hierarchy, break down silos, and really understand all the different layers um, within an organization in terms of systems. And so it can be microcultures within an organization. It can be communication systems. So you can think of a systems thinking mentality and think of it um, you know, as you know, you know, production systems. And of course, that's kind of a technical way to look at it. But in addition to that, being aware of all of the other systems um, you know, that drive um, you know, the way organizations, the way organizations function. So there's never been a, a need in terms of like a call for leadership um, to recognize that leadership needs to have a systems view um, and look at systems not only within an organization, but systems outside organizations to have organizations that are participative involving many people's ideas, energy, talent, expertise, organizations that are inclusive, and also organizations that are emergent, able to move and adapt nimbly in a minefield of um, uncertainty. 
And so the need for transformational leadership truly has never been um, greater. And one of the um, uh, thought leaders on this topic of transformational leadership is Dr. Monica Sharma. And Dr. Sharma, trained as a physician and epidemiologist, worked um, on leadership and taught leadership within the United Nations um, for 22 years. And when um, Dr. Sharma talks about transformational leadership, she talks about um, the qualities that are needed of transformational leaders and that personal transformation is necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for social and planetary transformation. What's necessary also is action grounded in universal values and informed by pattern and systems thinking. So you know, sort of from that drawing again, the focus on self-awareness, the focus on pattern and systems thinking, but a big part of her work talks about the importance of grounding our leadership um, in values and the universal values that she writes about that anchor and sustain transformational leadership are values of dignity, compassion, and equity, fairness. So when you think about this world that we're in, um, chaotic, sometimes it's referred to as a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, um, there's probably never been um, a, a need greater for leaders to cultivate skills of resilience. Um, in so many ways, resilience is key to sustainability. And I wanna quickly define resilience for you and there's many authors that write about resilience. I really appreciate the work of Dr. Stephen Southwick, a psychiatrist who describes resiliency as the ability to bend but not break and bounce back. After encountering, encountering difficult, uh, difficulty or setbacks and sometimes even grow stronger. Another definition um, of resilience um, refers to resilient organizations. And this comes from the book, Why Things Bounce Back. And Zoli writes, the capacity of a system, enterprise, or individual to maintain core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically um, changed circumstances. So definitions of resilience. Um, in the book by Southwick um, um, and colleagues titled Leadership and Resilience, they write that leaders and companies that are imbued with resilience don't just survive but they thrive in the face of change and uncertainty. So the big question that um, I think is on so many people's mind is how do we um, develop resilience? And one of the, the keys, um, and this really comes from um, research that looks at the link between um, resiliency and well-being, um, is to invest in, in well-being. And so I'm going to talk about well-being and well-being can be thought of in terms of individual well-being, you as a leader, your well-being, and the same six dimensions of well-being that I'm going to be talking about today. You can also be thinking about those from an organizational perspective. Um, so the six dimensions are, um, first of all, the, the dimension of health. And we know that um, uh, people's lifestyle behaviors, what they eat, um, how much they exercise and move, sleep and manage and stress and emotions has a huge impact on well being. In fact, it's estimated that 80 to 90% of how healthy people are has nothing to do with healthcare providers, hospitals, or drugs. It has to do with those lifestyle behaviors. So our health is very connected to our well being and our resilience. Purpose is very connected to well-being. I'm sure you can think of people that you know that are healthy, but they don't have well-being in their lives or people that might have really compromised health, but they exude well-being. And often it's because these other dimensions are so attended to. Purpose um, matters at every age and stage of life. Um, one of the authors that's written a lot on purpose that Carlson Executive has hosted many, many times is Richard Leiter. And Richard writes about how purpose is critical at every age and stage of life. We need to have a reason to get up in the morning. 
there actually is really interesting research emerging on the importance role of purpose. Um, one recent study that was done of over 6,000 adults found that people that didn't have purpose in their life were at a 15% higher risk of death. Relationships are so core to well-being and resilience. In the United States, we know that there's a lot of depression. There actually is even more loneliness um, than depression. And the health risks of being alone are comparable to the risks associated with many chronic diseases, such as high blood pressure, other forms of heart disease, um, yeah, and obesity. So cultivating relationships is critical. Community is critical to our well-being. Um, the community we live in has a huge impact on our well-being. And when we think of community, we think about the qualities of a community. So is a community livable? And you can just imagine the characteristics of livability. You can think of everything from roads and bridges to art and museums and culture that makes a community livable. But also important is equity. Is there access and is there fairness within the community? Equity has a huge impact on our well being. And finally, within the community sector, our connectedness. You can have a lot of assets in a community, but if people aren't connected, if they're not plugged in, um, they, it, the, the, those assets in the community don't advantage them. So, community is so critical to well being. And then the last two areas um, are safety and security. If people don't feel safe and secure for any reason, whether it's financial insecurity, food insecurity, fear of violence um, in their community, that erodes well being. And finally, there's the whole area of the environment. And with the environment, you can think of things like clean air, clean water, not having toxins in the environment, but there's thousands of studies that have now looked at the built environment. The built environment, our, our homes, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, communities, cities, huge impact on our, our health and well-being. And then you can also look at the environment from the planetary health perspective and recognize that um, compromising planetary health impacts all of those areas of well-being. So I invited you to think about this um, at a personal level in terms of sort of how you are doing as a leader um, with each one of these areas of well-being. Um, and I'm going to invite you in just a minute to answer a poll question about that. Um, but before that, I want to just um, share with you this definition that I love of well-being that comes from Atul Gawande, a physician. And he writes that well-being is those reasons of why it is that we want to be alive. So for you as a leader, what aspect of well-being is most important for you to work on personally as a leader? So really interesting results emerging. So the two top areas, um, clearly health um, and relationships. So thank you for that, Molly. You, we can um, pull that um, poll down now. And so, you know, while we're not going to be focusing today on organizational well-being, I think it's not a stretch for you to think of these same six dimensions and how they might show up in an organization. What's the health of the organization? Is there clarity of purpose? What are the quality of relationships? Is there a sense of community? What are the safety and security issues within um, the, the organizational world? And again, many areas to look at in terms of the environment, um, incur, including um, stewardship. So the, there's a close tie between well being and organizational success. Research shows that the most successful and innovative organizations are built on cultures of engagement and well being. That we know that the best talent and the greatest contributions to society come not from the organizations that pay the highest wages, rather from the organizations that have the most effective cultures. 
So the tie between engagement and well being is very strong. Employees who feel that their well being is supported are more engaged. Engaged employees are more effective. They have less absenteeism, higher levels of performance, and they're more productive. Engaged employees are less likely to exhibit signs of burnout. And engaged employees are four times less likely um, to leave an organization. So in summary, in this whole area of leadership, well-being, and resilience, it's so critical to be able to identify what are the principles and the practices and the values that are driving your leadership. Um, to be aware of important leadership characteristics in terms of the competencies of leaders that are needed today. To be looking at ways that you can, as a leader, increase your own resilience and create within your organization um, a culture of well being and engagement. And um, certainly, I think um, there are important metrics um, in terms of, um, of, of reasons to sort of move in this direction and measures of success. And it will be really exciting to hear um, Nancy speak shortly um, about um, you know, room and board and um, those um, measures of success in that organization. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over, um, uh, Marianne, to you. Mm. Thank you very much, Mary Jo. I'm really pleased to be with all of you today. I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about self-leadership and the role of mindfulness. And I think Otto Scharmer here does a, a, a wonderful statement about the importance of uh, resilience and well-being uh, from the inside out, if you will, uh, growing stronger both as leaders and organizations. Next, Mary Jo. Uh, at the center, some of you uh, may have noticed that over the past several years, uh, mindfulness has really been predominant in our popular culture. However, uh, studying and practicing and teaching mindfulness has been something that we at the center have been doing for over 15 years. You heard about Mary Jo's experience in leading us in research on mindfulness as well. And we really uh, put mindfulness at the core of our well being model, permeating every one of the six dimensions. And when we talk about mindful self leadership, there are many definitions, and many people are using that term self leadership these days. But one I particularly like is the work by Bryant and Hazen. And they talk about this coherence between our intentions and actions, how we actually show up in the world and serve others, having a positive impact on them. It really is leadership from the inside out. And mindfulness, let's talk about a good definition for mindfulness. The definition that we use is actually a combination of definitions from Diana Winston at UCLA and John Kabat-Zinn, the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction that again, we've been teaching at the center for over 15 years. And mindfulness is intentionally paying attention to the present moment, which sounds fairly simple. But for most of us, if we stop to look and there's research that validates some of this as well, the far majority of the time, our minds are actually wandering to one of two places, either anticipating the future, the good planners that we are as leaders, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with planning. But when we're constantly leading into the future, it can also lead to increased anxiety. And if we're leaning into the past, it can lead to rumination. So being all hands on deck right here, right now, allows us to lead with more resilience and more resourcefulness. There are attitudes that we bring as well, openness, curiosity, a kindness, this willingness to be with what is. John Kabat-Zinn in his definition uses a term that some misunderstand and he calls it a non-judgmental awareness. That doesn't mean that you don't have uh, a lack of discernment, but what it does mean is that we're able to suspend judgment, that we're able to be more inclusive of other perspectives, to broaden our own perspective. We also know that the brain has a negativity bias. We're hardwired that way in order to survive. 
So mindful awareness and attention also allows us to see the good in our lives and to cultivate that with a richness as well. Now, mindfulness is an innate ability that we all have. We're, we're born with this and the practice, not unlike working out in a gym, builds our, our muscular system, we can actually build the capacity of our mind through practice to enrich and enhance this innate quality. Another misnomer, I think some people think that mindfulness is a, a, a very uh, a self-centered practice. In reality, mindfulness, I found this, and I know many other leaders have as well, that mindfulness is also other-oriented. It involves a very important social and environmental awareness. When Mary Jo was talking about transformational leadership earlier, she talked about this incredible need we have right now in our world to be more inclusive of other perspectives in order to transform some of the very serious and important issues that are facing us right now. So when we're mindful, we know the research tells us that we're able to see and respond to others with greater sensitivity and understanding. Again, leadership and awareness from the inside out. Now, uh, mindfulness I, uh, and this practice and this growing the muscle of mindfulness can take place in addition to a formal mindfulness meditation. There can be many informal practices. In the poll that we did earlier, when you talked about a, a skill that was lacking that you needed to enhance as leaders, you felt was, it was listening. This ability to deeply listen, a beautiful mindful practice is mindful communication, starting with being very present to our communications and interactions with others. Uh, Janice Monterino wrote a book called Finding the Space to Lead, which was about her mindfulness journey. She uh, used to work at General Mills. And part of a, a cornerstone of her teaching that I really like when we talk about these informal practices is periodically throughout your day, taking purposeful, mindful pauses, noticing when we're distracted or feeling reactive or just not present in a Zoom meeting or otherwise, taking a couple of deep breaths, bringing our attention here and remembering our deepest intentions to show up with all our resources. And both of those, the formal and informal practices, we know can build states of mindfulness and eventually, again, cultivate traits of mindfulness more as a default rather than our autopilot tendencies. This is a lovely quote by Jack Kornfield. Some of you may be familiar with Jack Kornfield. He and others really bought uh, the uh, practice of mindfulness uh, uh, to this country many, many years ago. And he talks about transformation is not just abstract or idealistic promise. It's an actual physical possibility. We are neurologically transformed by whatever we practice, by whatever we pay attention to, one might say as well. So we can literally, uh, science shows us this, some of the neuroscience and mindfulness, tells us that through the practice of mindfulness, over time, we can actually change the structure of our brain, having more of a default, if you will, to being present, to being more intentionally aware and alive to what's here right now. Now, uh, speaking of research, I, I won't have a lot of time to go into this today, but I did wanna highlight to you or for you right now, some of the research in terms of the functional domains of mindfulness and what we impact with this practice of mindfulness. And when I talk about practice of mindfulness, I'm not talking about going away to a cave or even an hour long of practice a day. Some of the dosage that we've seen where we see some of these results is 10 to 20 minutes of practice a day. So the domains that are enhanced are attention. And when you read the, the work of Daniel Goleman and many others who are talking about emotional intelligence and our capacity to be very effective leaders, being able to focus and pay attention is obviously a cornerstone, a cornerstone of leadership and also self-regulation and self-awareness, the two primary foundational aspects of cultivating emotional intelligence. And then cognition, this ability to be flexible. Mary Jo was talking about that earlier. In our behavior, self-regulation, moving away from our autopilot reactivity and understanding that we can take pauses in our days and actually respond more intentionally with our better selves, if you will. 
physiology change, stress reduction, must, much research in mindfulness done around the ability to reduce our, our, our uh, stress, neuroplasticity, again, the ability to change the brain through regular practice and aging. Research has been done on telomeres, the uh, outer coating of our chromosomes uh, as we age tend to deteriorate. And what we have found through regular practice is a strengthening of the telomeres. And emotions, less reactivity, more capacity to broaden uh, our ability to respond with a broader range of emotions. And the life cycle of emotion doesn't last so long, perhaps. All of this leading again, when we're talking about leadership and workplace benefits of mindfulness, uh, some of the early research is showing us uh, some enhanced uh, performance, uh, relationships, emotional intelligence, and of course, well being as well. So I thought it might be nice, rather than to just talk about resilience and mindfulness, to actually do a practice together. This won't be a long practice, but at least touching into having a taste of mindfulness. So I'll guide you through a practice now. So just settling in to a comfortable seated position. It can be helpful to have both your feet on the floor. It grounds the body a little bit. And throughout this exercise, you can choose to have your eyes open or closed, whatever feels most appropriate to you. If they're open, you might just want to choose a, a fixed spot in front of you that kind of minimizes the chatter in the mind when we can quiet the visual field. That's the only reason for doing that. So settling in now. Turning your attention inward, this attention that so often is scattered looking for the next shiny object and turning inward now. Since the body is always in the present moment, what a terrific tool to come home to. An instrument of awareness for us now. Taking a moment to feel the feet in contact with the floor. or the placement of your hands right now. Maybe noticing a slight temperature, a coolness, a warmth in the body. Or maybe a subtle movement of air in contact with exposed skin. And let's together if you'd like, take two or three deeper, fuller in-breaths and out-breaths. And as you breathe out, really letting go. Holding tension, thoughts of what's already been and what's to come yet today. Really releasing that out-breath all the way out. And settling into being right here, right now. Perhaps taking a moment to narrow your focused attention to just the breath now. This constant companion of this body sensation that's always here for us to come home to, to bring us to the present moment. So no longer taking those deeper, fuller in-breaths or out-breaths, allowing that to recede into the background. And just noticing this natural rhythmic quality of the breath. The rising and falling, expansion, contraction. And when you notice that the mind wanders away, which of course, it inevitably will because our minds love to wander. So just gently noticing this and then escorting your attention right back to just this breath, just this moment. And now when you're ready, allowing this awareness, this more focused attention we've had on the breath, 
to just recede into the background for now. Of course, it's still here for you to come home to at any point in this meditation or throughout your day. But for now, I'd like to drop in a mindful reflection on resilience. And I'd like you to recall a period or a time in your life, perhaps that you went through a difficulty, maybe recently or in the past. Something that you came through that you're now on the other side of. And taking a moment now to recall what was present that allowed you to move through that difficulty. To perhaps persevere, coming through it even stronger, having perhaps learned or grown from the challenge. What was present that you drew upon, perhaps that you developed, cultivated? In retrospect now, just identifying this. and allowing whatever arises to the surface to just be held in your awareness now. And maybe receding a bit into the background. And let's bring our awareness now back to the body as a whole sitting here again. The feel of the feet in contact with the floor, the weight of the body resting in the chair. And let's uh, bring this meditation to a conclusion, this reflective inquiry, by taking in a last final deep in-breath and out-breath. And if your eyes have been closed, opening them now, maybe doing a stretch or looking around the room, reorienting yourself with the room you're sitting in. Thank you for joining me on that exercise, that inquiry on resilience. So what I'd like to do now is to just uh, open this up in chat uh, and what was present. I thought it might be really nice to remember the strengths that we have, how we learn from those challenges and it makes us grow stronger not just as individual leaders, but also as organizations. So from your personal perspective, if you could just put in chat now a word or a phrase to capture what you noticed in that inquiry, what showed up for you in terms of uh, something that was present that really helped you get through that. Yeah, we're getting a lot of great responses already. Um, a few that have come up in the chat are centering relationships, um, reflection, intuition, um, commitment to team, uh, optimism, calmness, having compassion, courage, um, just more wonderful responses that we couldn't have time to get through. But um, strength seeking support are, are a couple more I'm seeing as a common theme. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. Lovely quality, some of which we've already referred to in the presentation today. Um, uh, something I want to underscore about resilience too that Mary Jo talked about a little bit earlier, and that was the, the health aspect, the quality of sleep and coming back to the basics and caring for ourselves as well. All right, so um, this is a quote that you see now on the screen from the late Stephen Hawking. And uh, he has this quote that I just love. We are very, very small, particularly compared to the universe but we are profoundly capable of very, very big things. And I think that's important to remember, particularly during these especially challenging times, not only remembering that from ourselves, about ourselves and being able to draw from what we've learned from the past, but also instilling that in those that we lead, remembering our inner strengths and our capacity, the strength of our ancestors, 
to have also gone through very difficult times, leaders in our organizations, previous leaders as well. All right, I think that's, um, that's it, Mary Jo, so uh, we can move on. Well, Mary Ann, thank you so much. I just wanna say that Mary Ann, in addition to being an incredibly gifted um, a mindfulness teacher, at the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. She also, I think, brings a richness given her corporate background. Um, prior to joining us at the Bakken Center, Marianne was a mindfulness facilitator and manager for Moment Health at United Health Group Ventures and a, a founding and senior instructor for the Institute for Mindful Leadership um, that originally piloted out of General Mills. So um, thank you very much, Marianne, for all um, that you bring to the center. So you've heard a lot about the characteristics of resilient leaders. And as I introduce the next speaker, um, uh, Nancy um, Gritix Manley, I want you to be thinking about these characteristics of resilient leaders. Um, they practice personal well-being. They have self-awareness. They learn and grow from challenges and mistakes. Um, and so within their organization, they encourage um, psychological um, safety. Their purpose and their principle driven and they support strong teams and workplaces, valuing inclusivity and interdependence. Since 1992, Nancy has led human resources for Room and Board, an omni-channel retailer of classic contemporary home furnishings that achieve annual sales in excess of 400 million. She also serves as a member of Room and Board's advisory board. They provide vision, strategic direction and financial oversight for Roman Board. Nancy provides expertise in the innovative leadership in business strategy and visioning, culture-based leadership development, performance management, wellness and staff member engagement. Her efforts are laser focused on preserving Roman Board's core philosophies and business culture while stimulating growth. She guides a team whose purpose is to foster a work environment that supports a staff member's desire to do good work and contribute to the success of the business while creating an environment that also enhances the well being of each individual. You can see why we invited her to be part of this panel today. Room and Board has consistently been recognized by leading employee engagement surveys as a top employer. So I'm really pleased to have joined me and Nancy um, Gritix Manley. Thank you so much, Mary Jo, for that introduction and, and Marianne for your, your um, lovely way that you guide us through your thoughts and through meditation. I'm just so honored to be part of this conversation today. I think both uh, the executive education program at the Carlson School, as well as the early Bakken Center of Spirituality and Healing, are really kindred spirits in that I think that they really understand the wisdom that's to be found in the human experience, which is really something that drives room and board as well. So what I'd like to do this morning is just talk a little bit about room and board, our business, and the culture that we have created over the last um, almost 30 years, as Mary Jo indicated, I've been here since 1992. And once you've got a feel for room board and our culture, then I'll dive into leadership um, and how we really cultivate uh, the principles and the attributes that are re related to resilience. So if we can at the next slide, thank you. Um, as uh, Mary Jo indicated, we are a Minnesota-based retailer of home furnishings. Um, really focusing on an aesthetic of, of modernism in the home. I think our hallmarks as a business are, are many, um, being biased, obviously, but I chose a few to highlight this morning. We are um, so fortunate to work with wonderful American craftsmen and women who are so talented with whatever medium they choose, whether that be solid wood, steel, natural stone, et cetera. And because they're so good at their craft, we can then lead the design of the furniture. And together we create really exclusive designs and over 93% of what we sell is American made, something that we've always done and we're very proud of. And then we also work so hard to create a really 
wonderful experience for our customers, understanding the the reverence we we have in in being asked to do something as intimate as help them furnish their home and and create a place where they can live their lives in in comfort and safety. So we really take care of our customers, whether they engage with us in our store, on our website, through our one eight hundred number. And clearly, we're not a cash and carry environment, um, obviously. So our delivery associates who then go into the customer's home to um, deliver their product and place it in their home are as equally important in our um, ability to, to serve our customer in a, in a consistent and positive manner. It, it probably goes without saying that if you're going to try to do your work well, um, it's the individual that shows up every day to turn on the lights that, that does that work. And as Mary Jo indicated, we are really laser focused on creating a, a healthy, um, positive work environment where many of the needs on that wellness chart that was reviewed earlier are met. I think probably one of the most important ones is that of purpose. We have always built um, our, our employment model, if you will, on the sense that people should find their, their life's work and everyone has a calling. And we try so hard to find individuals who are just super excited about the work that we invite them to do here at Women Board. And when you do that and then surround them in a culture that meets their needs, really wonderful things happen. So a tremendous amount of effort is focused on our people. And then values-based leadership um, in which resilience resides is, is really how we've come to achieve some of the successes we've seen as an organization um, and really focusing on our, our leaders. I think one of the earliest um, lessons I learned as an HR practitioner was that um, my role was not best served being an advocate for individual employees, which may sound odd, um, but my, my first role in HR was one where people would come to me and confide because they didn't feel they were well-managed, paid fairly, given opportunity, whatever their issues may be, and I advocated on their behalf with their leaders to try to resolve their issues. And at the end of the day, although those staff members had an affinity with me, they often ended up leaving the organization because the relationship with their manager was not what it should be. So I quickly pivoted and understood that the best impact that I could have on the lives of our staff members was to ensure that they had a fair and capable leader. And as we delve into leadership, let's see how we've tried to achieve that at Women Board. Next slide, please. Thank you. So before we talk about leadership, I just wanted to give a nod to our, our guiding principles. And this is really the fundamental document um, that defines our culture. And I think what's really important is to understand where this document came from. It's over 25 years old, I would imagine, although it's had some, some edits and reiterations over the years. Um, but when we were a young company, and many of us as new leaders were here trying to, to harness what we were a part of, um, we would meet often and just talk about the things that were important to us, and sometimes merely the things that we would say every day. Um, and we ended up crafting our initial guiding principles document with words like, we need to be respectful, we have to take care of the customer, we want people to love their work, we have to understand business and the financial mechanisms that drive success and on and on and on. And once we committed what we were saying every day on paper, it really solidified us as a team. And many of those leaders are still here today at Room and Board. And we began to use those words as a way to lead. So a real practical example, um, um, Bruce Champeau, who's now our president uh, at, at way back when was leading our Minneapolis Delivery Center, and if he was coaching a delivery associate that was late, his conversation wasn't focused on you were late today. It was focused on when you're late, that's not respectful. You have a delivery partner and a customer and et cetera, et cetera. So it was about talking about principles and values. And we recognized very quickly when we spoke in that manner, our words resonated with our teams in a very magical way. So this document that we have still today has been the underpinning of, of our culture. 
And it really has four big buckets. It's a two page document. So certainly not anything that I can review here in detail, but the first big umbrella is respect and relationships and how important it is to create an environment where people feel safe and respected and can build authentic and genuine relationships. We are very um, focused on, again, hiring people who love their work. And if you do that and create the right environment, they stay. With Room and Board, we have lots of folks with tenure and those relationships become magical over the years. We're really um, equally vested in individual accountability and making sure that everyone understands that the guiding principles are not something that the Room and Board company or entity does. It's each of us, we are the entity, we are the company, and we all need to take accountability for our actions and how we affect one another. It's also very important that all staff members understand the business. We are completely transparent with all of our financial metrics of success and financials. And not only do we share that, but there's an expectation that people understand where in that um, set of information do they engage and what metrics do they affect. And then it's also part of, of or important to us, I should say, to make sure that we, we don't forget that kind of true to the, the quote Marian so we're very small um, and we're, we're certainly part of something bigger and and we have a responsibility and I hope a, a passion to think about sustainability, social justice um, and and other kind of areas of our community in our lives um, that we serve and serve in a way that that makes sense. So we we focus a lot on giving back in a much bigger sense than, than what our business model would, would dictate. So these principles really set the tone for not only leadership, but individual leadership and in our culture. And they really um, resonate with each and every staff member that we have here at Room and Board. So now with the next slide, if we'd like to dig in a bit to leadership. Um, as I said, leadership is a role that we take very seriously. We try very, very hard not to move individuals into a leadership role unless we are really convinced or certain that they will lead people first and foremost. Um, we just feel that that's, that's so important. I think we all know um, how a good day's work can affect us. And we believe very strongly that we have a tremendous opportunity to send people home at the end of every day, a little bit better than when they showed up in the morning. And when you do that, they go out into the community and they're better parents and partners and community members and, and et cetera, and come back the next morning, perhaps just a little bit better yet. And we really feel that leadership is a key to creating an environment where that happens. Every leader at Room Board essentially has two job descriptions. Um, one is very um, technical, if you will. It has to do with what talent they've brought the company, whether they're an accounting manager or a retail manager or a product designer, they have a role definition that defines their expertise. However, as leaders, we all share a leadership role definition or these leadership principles. And there are really six um, buckets of, of context that we paint around these leadership principles. The first has to do with integrity and understanding that how we lead defines us with integrity, with transparency, and with a genuine intent to, um, to show up every day, to be present, as Marianne spoke to, uh, is so critical as a leader. Our leaders are expected to cultivate our culture of mutual trust and respect, really a, a, a tie right back to the guiding principles that I just referenced and that they weave those values into their work every day. We expect our leaders to surround themselves with passion and talent. I think that this is one thing that we have done well um, in the sense that we're very cognizant that we have the right people in each role. And it's important to us to really manage uh, rigorously yet respectfully those who may not be in the right role because there's nothing worse than seeing someone struggle and not achieve the success that they're capable of. So we really work very diligently to ensure that we've got the right folks on the bus. 
We're here also to encourage career growth and longevity. Again, I mentioned relationships is part of our formula and we, we really relish the environment where people know one another and we're invested in one another's success. We're also expected to take a long-term view of the business. Even when making short-term decisions, we need to play out if in fact it's the right decision in the long-term. And then we work together to build a leadership community and to support one another in our efforts. And actually the, the final bullet there is to protect the safety of our team and the security of our assets. And that has never become as relevant as it is today in the midst of a COVID pandemic um, to talk about health and safety of our teams and making sure that we are um, setting the tone and the pace and the expectations to keep our staff, our customers and all of those people that we affect um, healthy and safe. So that's really, a tie that, that, that binds us as leaders that we share this role definition. And now we'll get into the practical application of, of resilience. I so appreciate the different definitions that have been shared here this morning about resilience. We too think it's that adaptability to work through adversity and come out to the other side with that strong effort, um, effort to come out better, to come out smarter, um, to come out with more, more wisdom or, or introspection. Um, the value in having to be resilient and tackle a problem is to learn and to grow. And that is really our focus. And this, this is really practical, but I think it gets to the nuts and bolts of how we define value-based leadership in our environment. As I studied a bit about resilience, I found the definition I just spoke to, but more so a lot of the definitions then stated different attributes that led to one being resilient. And our leadership model is really one of, of attributes. And you'll see those bullet, point, bullet pointed on this list. Um, so we, we talked to our leaders about their, um, it's necessary that they really manage in three different ways. They need to lead by example, they need to get work done through others and they need to inspire success. So if you think about leading my example, that's when a leader knows that he or she needs to jump in and work side by side with their teams to understand the problem, to get work done, to whatever it is. But there are times when a manager, at least in our culture needs to jump in and be part of getting the work physically or intellectually complete. And then we've defined in our culture, the attributes that we think are important to build as a leader to make sure that you can do this. So it's, it's work ethic, right? If you think you're the leader that doesn't need to roll up your sleeves, that's not gonna work here. Um, you need to be authentic and a relationship builder because you need to be the manager that folks welcome when you show up to help them, uh, not a manager that makes folks nervous when you do that. And that inclusivity to understand and kind of build a team around you as you do that is so critical. There are also times when a leader needs to manage, and this is perhaps that more traditional definition of, of leadership where you need to get work done through others, you need to get folks in the right role, you need to allocate resources, you need to communicate what needs to get done, you need to be agile to solve problems, and therefore those are the attributes that we feel define success when a manager literally needs to sit down and, and lead a team and get work done through others. Equally important, a manager needs to understand when to paint vision because it's great to get work done with others. It's great to manage a team. But if you don't build context around why, why are we here? What are we doing that's important? How is it changing your life, the life of your peers, the value we provide our customers? It's really all for naught in our, in our mind's eye. So to be a, a, a leader who knows how to paint vision, you need to have passion. You need to be able to, to see strategically the future and where the organization and the individual may fit in that future. You need to be innovative and you need to be optimistic um, when, when talking about the future. So as we work with our managers, we always talk about, you know, when do you use which skill and what attributes do you need to, to flex in order to be successful? Um, this slide, if you will, is right off our internet site. And if you could, 
uh, we're able to click into all of these different attributes and, and learn deeply about books and resources and quotes and projects and things that one can do to, to, fit, to build and flex these muscles and these leadership attributes. A very small example of how this works in reality. So in March, when COVID began to be a, a reality and really overcoming or overpowering, I should say, our, our daily lives, um, my peer group, as Mary Jo indicated in the introduction, um, our president and our CFO and myself, we, we got into the contribution mode and we jumped into meetings, we talked to our leaders, we read executive orders, we read the CDC website, we tried very hard to understand what in the world is happening. That context allowed us to, to jump into the managing phase where we needed to both think about this health and safety of our staff and our customers, as well as protecting our business. We set up hotlines, we had communication plans. We also looked at the business and thought of different ways that we felt that we could, although closing our locations for a time, still stay engaged with our customers and, and drive our sales. Um, it was all about agility and communication. But within all of that chaos, there was a fair amount of fear and uncertainty. So we also had to paint vision. And I one day took the time to reach out to our leaders and reminded them of a story in the book, Good to Great by Jim Collins, which is kind of a, a, a foundational uh, read for those of us that lead in room board. And in that book, he speaks of the Stockdale principle. And Stockdale was a prisoner in the Vietnam War and noticed that his peers who, who set a definitive um, date for their future didn't uh, fare well. They thought, I'll be out of the prison war camp by my birthday, by Christmas, when my son gets married, whatever that date was, and the date would come and go and they would fail um, and, and really, really struggle. And Stockdale realized that it was important to paint a vision of his freedom and what that would look like, but he knew he could not control um, the timing of his future. And he felt that he uh, fared much better having that attitude. So we talked to our leaders about that and said, we hear people say by the end of the summer, when school starts, when it's 2021, and kind of putting some sort of, and it's so human, right? To say, this will be over <laughs> X, Y, Z, because we all want that. And we had to talk about what that means and how they need to shift their thinking and in turn the thinking of their teams to make sure that we can continue to be resilient and work through um, this pandemic and its effect on our, our lives. So it's a very simple example of how we, we always go back to this model and seem to rely on these leadership engagement styles and the attributes that define our, our success. And uh, certainly anything I've discussed today, whether it's our guiding principles, whether it's our leadership um, principles and role definitions and or this model, I'm more than happy to share in detail with anyone who would like to learn more. Um, but it truly has created a, a sense of community and purpose and, and really a resilient organization um, we have thrived for over 40 years. We're actually having our um, best year ever. When I began here, we did 11 million in sales. Um, actually, I need to revise what Mary Jo spoke to. We'll be just shy of 500 million this year. Our sales are more robust as ever. Um, certainly, hopefully, by some of the things that we've managed, but also the pandemic is really intensified one's uh, commitment and passion to their home and we're able to meet that need. Um, but we will survive this and, and be stronger on the other end. Um, and, and we've done that for years and will continue to do because we place so much emphasis on, on, on principled leadership. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Um, <laughs> I'm going to invite Marianne to join us now um, on the screen as well. So thank you, Marianne, for coming up. I'm going to stop screen sharing here. Um, and um, we're really going to have a conversation and then to take some questions um, from you as well. And I'd like to begin, Nancy, by asking, um, you know, the first question. Um, and, and that is, 
Room and Board has such an incredibly strong culture. And a lot of organizations talk about culture, but culture kind of stays in the C-suite. It doesn't necessarily permeate deep in the organization. And I'm wondering if you could share with us, you know, you talked about, you know, the values and the principles that you inculcate in kind of people when you're onboarding them. But how do you actually, in a practical way, I mean, do you have a formal leadership development program um, at room and board, or is this something that is more um, informal, or is it a combination? It's, it's a combination. Um, the information I spoke to about our leader, leadership engagement styles and the attributes are the basis of, of leadership development. So if we have an individual who aspires to lead his or her team or one of our business entities, I have a team of, of HR uh, partners who are fabulous and they work very closely with those individuals as well as that individual's leader and their mentors to really guide them through a self-assessment of, of their strengths, what they do well, where they need to lean and grow, learn and grow. And we really look um, to each individual to really help us decide or define what steps they need to take and what they need to learn. And I think the, the thing that we do the most to help that is then look for real practical applications of how one can exercise agility, um, mm -hmm. for example. And uh, we think that it's, it's great to read, it's great to have conversations, but one learns often by doing. So we try very hard to create opportunities that are experiential to give people the opportunity to, to lead. Um, and as you say, our, our guiding principles and our culture are infused in everything that we do at all levels of the organization. So at least within the organization, a new leader has that context and they understand how we make decisions and the things that we value. So it sounds to me like you really personalize um, as well to the individual, the, the leadership um, you know, development approach that you take. Um, there's a question that Ann Rausch um, uh, sent in, and I'm going to actually pose this to both you and Marianne. And Marianne, we'll start with you. Can you give an example of true transparency? Um, and she writes, I've experienced leaders who talk the talk about transparency, but they don't seem to be living it. Now, I'll let Nancy mention transparency, and I think it was your financials, right, that, that you, and so I'm going to let you speak to that. You know, a word that I prefer um, over transparency is authenticity. And I think that when we're authentic, when we're really showing up, uh, there's a transparency to that. Uh, I think that requires some empathy for others. I also think it requires the courage to be vulnerable, to be transparent, to be authentic, carries with it a role of showing up as a human being to another human being. And I think the work of Brene Brown and her work with leaders is a really uh, pivotal and informative uh, resource for many of us to follow. Um, but um, I, I think first and foremost, it's understanding and recognizing that as leaders and managers, there are some things that we need to be careful about how and when we reveal, right? There's timing that's with that. Um, so there's always going to be those conditions uh, but I think first and foremost, showing up as your whole self present uh, has an authenticity to it, and I think conveys that transparency. Nancy, Marianne, you referenced our financials, and and to us, um, Marianne, that's at the baseline, and we feel that people are just more engaged when they understand what it is they can affect. But a real life example with with COVID nineteen when we had a delivery associate who had um, been diagnosed positively with COVID, we realized his, his contagion period was 48 hours before his symptoms arose. And we understood that he had been in the homes of our customers during that time. Of course, with face masks, following protocol, et cetera. So we didn't feel there was a risk of exposure, but we thought, well, what do we do? You know, if it were my home, I would like someone to share that with me. So it didn't take us long at all to say, you know what, transparency is the right thing to do. And we have since done that, um, thankfully, only a couple of times uh, since the pandemic began when we realized that we put customers in, in 
an exposure situation if you're in their home and we we communicate to that to them and not only is that the right thing to do for our customers but it continues to send the message to all of our employees that we are honest we're authentic that we care um, and time and time again that's how you live your values and your culture right if you say it you just don't do it as it relates to financials you're transparent when it's necessary to do so um, and this is one example where it, it was very clear that that was the right thing to do. So we we did that. Thank you for that, Nancy. You know, I'm just, just going to add one comment from the University of Minnesota, um, also pandemic related. Um, we have a relatively new president, President Joan Gable. And I would say that during this COVID-19 crisis, I mean, her communication has been so impeccable in, in several ways. It's been very, very clear and transparent. So she's very honest about financial stringency and what it means. Um, and it's also very frequent. And I think at times of crisis, it's so important to have communication that is clear, but that is also timely as well as um, transparent. And so um, I, I can just tell you personally, you know, sort of benefiting you know, from the leadership that she has at the university right now, as difficult as the situation is, I think we all do better when we have information um, and that we can then, you know, make our own decisions, you know, based on. So Nancy, this is a question for you from Rahel Nardos, who writes, um, how do you remind your members of your guiding principles? So it's front and center on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, how do you make it salient in everyday scenarios so that your members inhabit it? Well, I, I think, first of all, it goes to the authenticity of the document. And when we wrote that document, we weren't intending to write our value statement or our vision. It merely was what we believed. Um, so the authenticity of that document could not have been any stronger because it was just really more of an exercise that we went through to make sure that we were all on the same page, but thankfully we were. But in terms of how we make it live, it, it literally breathes in every decision that we make. Um, I think often when I communicate to the organization, I, I footnote my communication by quoting one of our guiding principles and then talking about what we've done and why it relates and has been guided to that document. Um, we tell folks often that if you're stuck, if you have a problem, read that document and you will find your answer. And I can personally say that has never failed me. And I don't know anyone else who's not been able to find guidance when reading through it. So it's a working piece of paper. We've never printed it. We've never put it on a wall. It's not on t-shirts. It's It should be folded in half and in your notebook and there every day. And we use it that way as leaders and we encourage our team members to do that as well. Um, so I don't have a, a methodology to it. It's truly who we are. Um, and because we have longevity within our roles, and many of us have been here 20, 25, 30 years, it just becomes embedded in how we speak and how we act. Thank you for that, Nancy. Um, Marianne, Joshua Chakala writes, um, would you say that mindfulness is a journey? And if so, what would you recommend when embarking on my own journey? Mm, that's wonderful. Yes, I think that mindfulness is a lifelong journey uh, and we're continually developing and growing. Uh, for yourself, if you're interested, for example, in a traditional mindfulness meditation practice, I would say start small, uh, maybe five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, kind of building up your capacity for stillness and mindful awareness. Also, getting um, uh, good guidance, I think, is very important. Uh, of course, you saw at the very, very beginning of this, before we started, there were all sorts of promos about some of the mindfulness classes that we teach at the university. But on our uh, website as well, our Taking Charge website, we have a number of guided meditations that you could also practice with. They're shorter, many different durations, but I would encourage you to get some, some good guidance uh, to support you in that, and then just build your practice over time. There are a number of terrific books and resources for you, as Nancy was saying, well, we don't really learn leadership through a book. 
Uh, I will say the same is true with the practice of mindfulness. So um, being part of a learning community at some stage in your development, I think can be really helpful and important. So I think Marianne, one of the things that you've emphasized, I think so well is that mindfulness is a practice. And so there is a practice of mindfulness meditation, but mindfulness is also a way of being. And so cultivating that quality of being present is um, you know, something that we can um, do throughout the day. It doesn't need any special equipment. <laughs> Oh, well. oh, necessarily even a lot of time. It's more yeah. of, a, of an awareness. Um, so Nancy, there are a couple of quick questions I'm going to pose to you. One comes from Stacy Crawford, who asks, um, do you use Gallup's strengths assessment for the assessment of strengths? And then Ann Barker says, asks, what staff assessment do you use? Um, so a lot of interest in how you assess um, your um, employees. Uh, thank you for that question. We do use StrengthsFinder, um, not so much as an assessment tool, but really to help people understand what what skills they have and what strengths they have. I think the whole intent of StrengthsFinder is to leverage the things that you do well. So that's one of the many tools that we use to help new and existing leaders further develop in their abilities to be good leaders. In terms of team assessments, um, I often call ourselves do-it-yourselfers because our culture and our environment is so unique. We often, I think, fare better when we create tools that are relevant to our business. So I mentioned our, our HR partners, uh, uh, members of my team, they work in partnership with our leaders. And uh, twice a year, we go through a leadership assessment or a, a team assessment process and a leadership assessment process where we kind of look for different ways to conduct conversations with our leaders to help them understand um, who's performing well um, in its simplest form we really look at two critical things um, how well they perform in their job and then their passion and fit for our culture uh, but we have a myriad of ways to do that and and frankly um, the tool becomes secondary to the conversation. Um, and it's our, my HR leaders meeting with their managers and just talking about their teams and identifying who's strong, who's had potential, who's growing, who may be struggling, who might have gifts to share with others. We, we really try to identify a lot of different um, um, strengths and weaknesses through that process. And I may say we don't have a formal performance appraisal process. We, we, just, we haven't for years. Um, each individual room board guides their own performance and they create their performance document and express commitments of what they hope to accomplish in the coming year. So it's a really kind of messy pie, um, but it, it works for us because we're really deeply engaged in the lives of our staff members. Wow, Nancy, that's really remarkable. You know, there are a number of questions that ask about the web link on the room and board side and ask about a book that you know has been mentioned. And it, as Molly um, said, at the beginning, following the webinar today, we will send you out um, a list of, of resources and we'll make sure um, that we include the specific link that the Nancy's talking about um, so that you can kind of delve deeper into that, um, that chart that you had that is so amazing. Um, this is another question I'm gonna pose to the two of you that comes from Amali Stead, um, Steidley. Um, she writes, trust is an essential piece of community and relationships. Can you give an example of broken trust within an organization that you've led um, or participated in and how you worked to rebuild that trust? And I'm wondering, Nancy, if we can start with you. Well, certainly I think it's when a leader doesn't fulfill their promise to guide and lead, the, guide and lead their team um, with a commitment to the individual and the team that they should have. And um, it happens where we start to hear inklings from staff members and other peers that someone is, is failing for a variety of reasons. And I think there have been times when that has lingered longer um, than it should. And when you finally do get to the point of, of, of barely dealing with that leader and often asking them to leave the organization, you have a pretty wounded, disengaged team who feels that you've not lived up to the promise of our guiding principles. So that forces you to get right back down to the 
the heart of the problem and talk it through and accept responsibility um, for what has happened and really practice that deep li listing that you mentioned to begin to build that trust again. So when there is a new leader um, and hopefully and thankfully the right leader uh, that comes into the scene next, um, a team is ready to believe again. But that that happens, you know, and, and again, it, I think it's all about leadership at the end of the day. And when that fails, it's it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm Marianne. Thank you for that. Uh, I have to say that prior to teaching mindfulness full time, I was an organization development consultant and I did mediation, public policy and in workplaces. And I'll, I saw this a lot, as you can imagine. And there are three things I think that just came off the top of my head here. Uh, the first is candor. The first is labeling it, uh, that, that transparency piece, bringing it out in the open. Uh, the second is creating a process and a time for healing, I think is really important. So I'd say time for healing and a process and candor. I think those three things are really key. And I'm going to give you a personal example of a, a company that I actually wasn't a consultant for that, but that I uh, worked for. Um, when I first started, I had known that years previous, there had been an, an ethical breach by leadership and it caused a great deal of consternation within the organization, the community. And uh, my very first week there, I was put through a leadership training and it was all values based. And right out the door, a top leadership, an executive of the company came in. And the very first thing out of this person's mouth was, this organization went through a rough period. Here's what happened. We feel badly about it. We're changing our culture. It's going to take some time. We need your help. Here's our values. Here's our principles. And here's how we're taking care of it. And we're expecting each one of you to also follow uh, uh, leading a life that's value and principle based while you work for this company. I was really impressed with that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing they talked about was that this is a 30 year journey. And I was kind of taken aback, but we know that real, and this is a very large corporation, but real organizational culture transformation does take time, maybe not 30 years. Uh, but what I liked about that was their long term commitment to integrity and living that out loud that way. So I was, uh, I continue to be impressed with that story that, and my own journey through that as well. Thank you for that, Marianne. There's one question that came from an anonymous attendee that was posed to me, and this will be the final question that we'll um, take. There's so much disruption right now in the organization, so much chaos. Is there a silver lining in this? And I can tell you, I, that's a question I think about a lot. And, you know, what comes to me is, that there are some silver linings that are emerging. I think one silver lining is people are really focusing on the question of what matters. What matters to them in their personal life? What matters to them in their work life? And so I really think it's an important time, not only as individuals, but as a society to really um, reevaluate um, uh, you know, the whole question of you know, what matters. I think another discovery um, that's coming out of this time is the discovery that um, there's great learnings and this is a great opportunity to really cultivate um, and develop resilience. And I think there's some surprises that are emerging in people's lives in terms of, I didn't think I could do this, but I have you know, discovered that I can. And the third one real quickly is that um, we are all in this together. And I think there's never been a more powerful time on the planet um, for this awareness that um, my individual action affects everyone around me. We are so inter, um, intertwined with each other and deeply um, connected. So incredible time of um, powerful learning um, you know, at this time. So as I move to closing, I'm gonna make just a few comments and then I'm gonna invite Nora Anderson back to um, close the webinar today. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us, and a special thanks to our speakers, um, Marianne and Nancy. Um, this has been really an incredible webinar today. We hope that you've gained some new insights about resilience and leadership to take back to your organization. We also hope that you'll stay connected to the Center and to the Carlson Executive Education we offer many events all year long that may be of interest to you. And also visit not only our websites, but our pages on Facebook um, to learn more about us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nora. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. 
I would like to echo your comments. Thank you to Nancy, Mary Ann, and to you, Mary Jo, for sharing this insight. We can tell by these wonderful questions and all of your participation in the chat that this, this was really a timely topic. I would like to thank all, everyone who is attending. Uh, I, it's just what an engaging session. We, lo we love to host events in person, but also in this virtual format, it's a, a wonderful option for us to come together. Um, I would like to thank our partnership with the Center for Spirituality and Healing and thank my colleagues at, the, at Carlson Executive Education. We have shown in this team so much resilience and many of the things shared here. And we hope that all of you have gained great insight uh, from the session today. We'll be sending an email uh, with, with ways to stay engaged as Mary Jo was mentioning. Uh, and we just look forward to, to staying in touch with all of you and inviting you back for, for our programs and events. Thank you very much.